Thank you so much, Megan. And thanks for the invitation to uh, present today. Um, so I was asked um, if I might talk a bit about bear, paleontology of Bears Ears National Monument and that region. Um, and you know, it's a it's a huge monument with a lot of paleontological and geological resources that don't get as much press necessarily as the cultural resources that are there, but it's just as important paleontologically and geologically. So I'll just talk about two uh, specific stories related to that uh, today, but it's just a fraction of, of um, the amazing geological and paleontological heritage in the monument. So um, this is the current map of Bears Ears National Monument. It spans from all the way up um, near Moab down to um, down to uh, Bluff and, and and Mexican Hat area, um, and it's about 1.3 million acres, so a really really large uh, large monument. And as a result, being on the Colorado Plateau here in in Utah, uh, Bears Ears has a great geologic uh, record, particularly sedimentary geologic record of the late Paleozoic through much of the Mesozoic. Um, there are volcan some volcanic units um, and igneous units that use um, that around the Apopo Mountains, but the rest of the bedrock is more or less Paleozoic and Mesozoic uh, sedimentary rocks and mostly non-marine. So I'm going to talk um, today about two, uh, two units, the Cutler Group, which spans the Pennsylvanian uh, Permian boundary or the, the Carboniferous Permian boundary and the Chinle formation, which is uh, much of the late Triassic, represents much of the late Triassic. Um, and just a note that this figures from a review paper on the paleontology of Bears Ears that some colleagues and I published in Geology of the Intermountain West a couple of years ago. So if you want to you know, find out more generally about the stratigraphy and paleontology of the region, uh, go check out that open access paper published by this organization. So. Um, so those two time intervals, just to, to zoom in on the geologic, um, we're going to be talking about the time right around 300 million years ago with the Cutler group. So that's uh, about 70 million years before the first dinosaurs. And then we're going to talk about time right around 210 million years ago with the Chinle formation. And that's during the time of some of the early dinosaurs here in Utah. Uh, well, let's start out with the Cutler group. Um, that's one of the things I'm sort of particularly excited about in, a mo in the moment, given um, uh, some ongoing um, grant funded research that I'll be talking about. So what's the context of this? Um, the Cutler group was deposited during the peak of what is known as the late Paleozoic Ice Age. So this is the last time the earth was in an ice house state uh, prior to, to 40 million years ago. Um, and so, it's of course somewhat relevant for understanding where we might be going in the future for in the sense that it's a natural experiment where we can look at how and why did the earth transition from an ice house to hot house state during the Permian. Um, and it's particularly exciting because there's been a lot of radioisotopic dating of glacial deposits in Gondwana recently that have revised our understanding of the timing of the ice age. So we now know that the Peak, let's see, I guess the, the laser pointer doesn't like uh, the screen there. So I'll use the cursor here. So um, there we go. Um, so we now know that the peak of glaciation in terms of area, aerial extent um, was during the latest uh, Carboniferous, basically right at the Carboniferous Permian boundary, and then slowly declined through the lower Permian. Um, and exactly what the extent was in the Northern Hemisphere, um, things like that are less well known. It, some of these reconstructions depend on how much CO2 is in the atmosphere, but we have a good record from the Southern Hemisphere of the glaciation because um, just those deposits are more accessible. And Utah was very close to the Paleo Equator at this time. So, just about somewhere between five to 10 degrees north of the Paleo Equator, depending on what part of the Pennsylvania Permian you're talking about. Um, and represents a complex sort of uh, assemblage of coastal, fluvial, and desert environments. 
And you can see that with this cross section here. So um, you, as you go towards the Northeast, you get more alluvial deposits coming off the Uncompadre Highlands. And as you go towards the West, you get more uh, distal deposits that some of which are fluvial, some of which are marine, some of which are aeolian. Um, a whole mix of stuff. And that makes it really exciting from a paleoenvironmental and paleontological standpoint, but it also makes it really complex when you're trying to correlate across the Paradox Basin, for example, trying to figure out what horizon, you know, by Luff is equivalent to the same horizon um, up by Moab, for example. Um, so this is sort of the area, the study area where our, my colleagues and I have been working. Um, from across basically a transect of Bears Ears National Monument all the way up to just north of it in Moab and in Valley of the Gods to the south. And you can see this is just one time slice of the Cedar Mesa sandstone, so an upper part of the, of the Cutler group. And you have a complex paleo landscape from um, smack dab in the middle of a uh, aeolian herb to completely fluvial deposits and um, even marine units off to the west, potentially. So, but one of the things that, that many, many workers have noticed both about the Cutler group and also the underlying Hermosa group that includes the Paradox Formation and the Honaker Trail is that they are very, very cyclical. Um, and this is true specifically throughout the Cutler, even in the Aeolian units, there are very, very clear cycles between, um, between dune and interdune deposits but also in the lower cutler beds between um, coastal marine, uh, fluvial, and uh, momentary aeolian units. Um, and so, of course, one of the big questions is what is causing this cyclicity? And uh, a number of authors have proposed that this is representing orbital cyclicity, so Milankovitch cycles. Um, and this is sort of a diagrammatic relative representation of the cyclicity observed in both the uh, Paradox and, um, and Hanukkah Trail, as well as through the entire Cutler here. And you can see there appear to be different frequencies, but it's not really clear because um, the, this is not scaled um, exactly to time. And we, um, particularly for the Cutler, we don't have really great precise age constraints. So that's kind of one of the key things you need if you're going to be able to interpret cycles as uh, Milankovitch cycles is knowing what, you know, what their duration is. But it has been proposed that these represent eccentricity cycles, so changes in uh, the shape of the Earth's orbit, um, both 100 and 400,000 year cycles from eccentricity. Um, that said, we know that there are other things going on. So Pangaea as a whole is drifting northward, so you're drifting closer to the arid, semi-arid belt out of the tropics. Um, and there are, there's longer term sea level change that's very clear um, in this sequence. Um, and so you have all these different potential processes imprinting on the sedimentological record. And that makes it difficult to tease apart what's controlling, um, which of those things are the predominant controls on the sedimentation and the paleo environment, of course, that organisms are living in. So, that's um, part of the reason I got interested in this is the animals and plants that are represented in this time because it's the first time in Earth's history where you have limbed animals with backbones um, that are fully terrestrial. They're no longer tied to water. They're laying eggs, um, they're laying hard shelled eggs, and so they don't need to go reproduce in the water. And um, we see this shift in uh, the Cutler group. So if you look at uh, fossils from the lower part of the Cutler group, they're dominated much more by aquatic animals in dark gray, um, and also things, amphibians that still need to go back to the water to reproduce. Whereas if you look at the uppermost part of the Cutler group, you have a lot more terrestrial animals that, um, that are not spending any time in the water at all. But, and this has been, you know, used as evidence to suggest that this is, you know, preserving this, this sort of really important ecological transition from more aquatic vertebrate communities to more terrestrial communities. But we have to take into account what's going on locally and regionally, right? This could simply be reflecting um, not some major evolutionary event, but um, local or regional changes in the paleo environment as things are drying in the paradox basin. So 
how do we test that hypothesis and tease apart those different um, controls? Um, I, there's no perfect modern analog for what the Paradox Basin in southeastern Utah is like, but um, I like to think a, bit, a little bit like the skeleton coast of Namibia, where you have um, an ocean coming right up to the shoreline with dunes coming from the other side, and you, then you have small rivers and streams and lakes um, interspersed among these uh, dunes. And of course, this is just a snapshot of one part of the time, but um, it is, uh, it's not a bad modern analog, at least. It probably was a bit wetter than what we see in Namibia today. Um, but it's, it's, you know, unusual to think about these giant ergs that are then coming right up to the coastline um, with, with rivers and interdunal ponds and things like that. So this is sort of a variety of different um, angles of this work with, with my colleagues and I sort of coalesced recently in a a new NSF funded um, project that's uh, been funded. Uh, we just finished the first year and we have two more years to go. And it involves uh, colleagues acro across the US and from several other countries as well. Um, the other PIs are Adam Hutton Locker at USC and Josh Feinberg at University of Minnesota. And we sort of have three goals with our work here in the Cutler. One is to actually figure out where the Carboniferous Permian boundary is within the Cutler group across the basin. We, it's not well known. People have made lots of assumptions, but um, it hasn't actually been identified. And use that as a way to help us anchor it to the international geologic time scale. And also look at what is the pace and the intensity of climate drying that's preserved in this uh, sequence, and what, if any, relationship it might have to the late Paleozoic Ice Age. We know that. You know, the Cenozoic Ice Ages were, con were predominantly controlled by, um, by orbital cycles, and so it would be exciting if we could show that there's, um, there's orbital cyclicity correlating both um, ice formation in Gondwana as well as um, sedimentation at the equator, uh, but we don't know that for the moment. Um, and then finally, um, to understand what, what's driving the evolution of these vertebrate communities, um, that are preserved as fossils within um, within the Cutler and how that might relate to the paleoclimate um, regime. So this is our study area in southeastern Utah. On the left, um, we've got outcrops of the Cutler group, and the blue are different fossil sites that we've already documented. Um, I've got a, a um, satellite map here, and most of our work is supposed to focused on three or four areas. So Cane Creek and Harrah Pass just outside of Moab, uh, Indian Creek um, in just outside of the Needles District of Canyonlands, um, Arch Canyon, and then Valley of the Gods area down by Bluff, um, as well as Cone Ridge area. So, but you'll notice there's also, we marked a core here, and I'd like to talk a little bit about that core um, for a moment. So uh, this is the Elk Ridge number one core, and it uh, preserves whole core from the lower Cedar Mesa sandstone all the way down through the Paradox Formation. And it was drilled in 1981 by the um, Department of Energy. Um, I assume most of you have heard of Yucca Mountain. This was drilled for that purpose. They were looking for places to store nuclear waste, and southeastern Utah was one of the proposed sites. So they drilled this and another core, the Gibson Dome Number 1, and they got sort of the data they needed for what they were interested in in terms of looking at nuclear waste storage. But really, um, these cores are totally untapped in terms of scientific potential. There's been a few studies on the Paradox and Honaker Trail parts of the core, but very specific um, studies. But for the most part, they haven't been touched in, you know, what is it now, nearly 40 years. So we were excited to sort of find out about this core through Don Rasmussen. Um, and um, we were lucky enough to get it on loan as part of the project from the Bureau of Economic Geology in Austin um, and you know, start to do some intensive research on it. We, because of our time period of interest, we only are working with the Cutler group and the upper two-thirds of the Honaker Trail form, formation. So we're not even going through the entire core just because of time and money sake. Um, so as many of you are aware, you know, there's great advantages to having whole round core, but um, it's harder to see things like sedimentary structures and details. Um, so the first step 
um, is at the Continental Scientific Drilling Facility in University of Minnesota was is to um, split the core into working half and an archive half. Uh, these are newly split cores uh, that are waiting to get imaged. Um, and so um, much of the last few months has been spent working on processing this core. Um, so we've um, they've got a whole prior to splitting it. There's a whole core scanner that measures natural gamma as well as magnetic susceptibility all in one go. Um, they're not magically showing up. This is a time lapse. People are putting them on the track there. Um, <laughs> but it's a very time efficient way to get data from a lot of core in stratigraphic sequence. Um, let's see. And then after the core is split, um, it's imaged um, with a color card so you get um, really good consistent images. Um, using a geotech uh, system there. Um, and then those data are combined in um, in their uh, um, visualization software. So you can actually use both the whole core data as well as the images to then describe the core in addition to having the core split cores in front of you. Um, and then finally, uh, the split cores get put on the XYZ machine which measures um, both magnetic susceptibility of the split core, but also um, it's got a photospectrometer that measures RGB channels so you can get an objective measure of color throughout the core. And finally, um, the next step that's going to happen later this fall is that one half of the core will go to the University of Minnesota Duluth to be uh, scanned using microXRF. Um, so we'll have a lot of data um, from this core to work with. Oops. So one of the, before we do anything else, um, one of the biggest challenges here is telling time. There's no ash or tough layers in the Cutler group that have been identified by us or others. And there's been quite a bit of detrital zircon work, but there's basically no um, uh, sort of young populations at all, in zircons in these samples that would provide maximum depositional age constraints. And so we had to look for other ways we could tell time. Now, we were, the one thing we were lucky about is that there are some of these marine limestones that are interbedded with this non-marine sequence. And we've been able to, working with um, a number of colleagues, get microfossils, um, age diagnostic microfossils. Um, I'm showing here conodonts. This is work in collaboration with Charles Henderson at University of Calgary. And we're also working with Mike Reed, um, who is uh, a fusel and a foram specialist. And so we've been able to get forams and, um, and conodonts, and these have been super helpful in figuring out exactly where within the latest Carboniferous and early Permian we are. Um, but, you know, their biostratigraphy always has its challenges. And so we were also interested in looking for other independent age constraints that would help us out. Well, um, another thing you can do with those marine layers is strontium isotope chemostratigraphy. Um, this is a bit of a scatter, but um, well, we're lucky that in the Carboniferous Permian, there's this big uh, decline in strontium isotope values of seawater um, through the latest Carboniferous and early Permian. And so um, if we get enough data points and sequence, we can figure out where we are on this line. Um, there are weighted average and lowest fit curve fits for, for the, the data set, but um, it's, I think it's always nice to show what the actual data are to, as opposed to just a smooth curve. So this is the ugly reality, right? <laughs> yeah. um, but um, so what we're doing is we've got both uh, bulk carbonate and brachiopods that we can get the, these data from, but you have to be very careful about diagenesis. So there's various trace elements you can use to screen for diagenesis and also um, SEM work, um, but also the phosphate of the calcium phosphate of conodonts is really resistant to diagenesis. So we can also analyze the conodonts themselves, and hopefully by that combination, we will get we will be able to um, also constrain where we are in time. And then the final thing is that the bad news is that this time interval is a supercron um, with basically no, no changes in magnetic polarity, except for this tiny interval right here, about 
200,000 years before the Carboniferous Permian boundary, when there is a momentary uh, polarity change called the Cardinitia. And um, we thought that it was worth going after this, trying to find it in our sequence, but also knowing that given how short it is, there's a chance it's not recorded in these non-marine sediments, right, which are episodic in nature. Um, and But I, I can't say too much other than we think we have evidence, at least in one section, that it's preserved in the Cutler group. And so this is great because it's a biostratigraphically independent datum that we can use to correlate across the basin if we can find it in the core and in other um, outcrops. So um, stay tuned on that, but, um, but we're hopeful that that'll be a really nice uh, datum for correlation as well. So in terms of the paleoclimate, um, we can use those magnetic susceptibility data, color data, um, and XRF data for cycle stratigraphy to look at hierarchy and power of the cycles in sequence. Um, and then work and hopefully then constrain those cycles using the, the um, age constraints I just talked about. And then um, we're looking at paleoclimate also by looking at measures of aridity as preserved in rock magnetism. Um, so there's a number of different environmental rock magnetic proxies that um, give you a relative sense of whether it's wetter or drier in um, paleosols and related uh, depositional environments. And this is work that's being headed up by Jonathan Stein, a postdoc of uh, Josh's at University of Minnesota. So what about the fossils? Um, that's a lot of geology, but it's because I'm, you know, I'm really excited about pulling together these data sets to get a much more comprehensive understanding of what's going on in the Cutler group and in the Paradox Basin. So uh, let's start out with um, the fossils that we find, vertebrate fossils we find in the lower Cutler beds. So this is an informal name for sort of the, the units that are found below the Cedar Mesa sandstone. They have different local names depending on where you are, but just easier to call them lower Cutler beds. And they're this mix of fluvial, um, shallow marine, and, and, um, and occasionally aeolian units. Um, so going from north to south, up by Moab in Harrah Pass Cane Creek area, we get um, evidence of these marine ecosystems. So here are these big teeth of, of relatives of sharks and rays, including really weird animals like petalodonts that are related to modern ratfish, but don't look anything like their modern relatives. But we also do get the animals that are living on land. We have um, we have this animal down here, which is, we've got a vertebral column, the skull's here, the arm is here, and the, the hind limbs are here. And um, that's um, probably an animal related to Samoria, which kind of looks like an amphibian, but it's a little bit more closely related to mammals and reptiles than it is to amphibians. We have fossils of one of the first uh, the first herbivores. So this is a, a group called diadectomorphs, and there's an articulated vertebral column here with part of a, uh, a, a finger here and some ribs um, and other fossils that aren't prepared yet that I, so I don't have, have photos to show you, but um, a number of different um, animals, both marine, freshwater, aquatic, and terrestrial are preserved. In the same sequence, as we go to south towards Indian Creek, we have um, a more diverse fossil assemblage just because we've been working there longer. So we have freshwater, uh, sh we have both, sorry, saltwater and freshwater sharks. Um, there's low fin fishes that are freshwater. We have lungfish here. It's a little bit blown out, but that's a lungfish tooth. Um, these burrowing freshwater uh, fish. There's limbless amphibians um, called aistopods, and again, uh, relatives of things like Samoria. Um, and, um, and also amphibians that um, are directly direct ancestors of frogs and salamanders and modern amphibians that we see today. Not far away, um, a couple of years ago, we got a report of this fossil in the Needle Stitch District of Canyonlands National Park in the wilderness area about five mile hike from the pavement. And um, it's a nearly complete skeleton. So the skull is up here, the vertebral column and tails here. Here's where the pelvis is and there's parts of the forelimb here. And it was exposed in a, a stream bed as you can see here. And, and in 2021, we went out and 
um, rock saw it. He got permission from the Park Service to rock saw it out. And it looks like um, it's a, a relative of these first herbivores that are called diadectomorphs, but one of the very early relatives before they were completely herbivorous. Um, and what's really cool is when we made a thin section um, of this, the matrix it's in, it's full of fusilinid foraminifera, and we were able to get conodonts out of it. So we have the vertebrates in the same exact level that we can also get by the stratigraphic age constraints that show us unambiguously this is earliest Permian, this particular level. And no surprise, it's near the top of the lower coupler beds. So it shows that the, the Carboniferous Permian boundary, at least in this area, is somewhere in the upper part of the lower coupler beds. Um, Valley of the Gods down south is the most diverse area because um, paleontologists have been working there since the late 50s, early 60s. Um, there's these weird boomerang shaped headed uh, amphibians, Diplocolis, more terrestrial amphibians like Eriops here, early reptiles, um, and a lot of our early ancestors, a group called Synapsids that eventually evolved into mammals. So Spinacodon is a close relative of Dimetrodon, if you're familiar with the sailbreath critter. Um, and this was a new species that Adam Huttmacher, my colleague, just described, Shashajaya Bermanai, and it was already featured in a murder mystery novel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and then other early uh, mammal relatives like Ophiacodon and Adaptosaurus. Um, and so again, we're seeing this mix of aquatic and terrestrial forms. If we move up section um, into the Cedar Mesa sandstone, um, Aeolian units are not well known for preserving uh, body fossils like bones and teeth. Um, they typically have lots of tracks, but we've been lucky that in the sort of erd margin environments, we've been able to find a pretty diverse assemblage of fossils in, in, in the creek. Um, and what this is, is looks like it's an interdunal pond. So where a small river or stream was um, basically dead ending into the, the edge of the erg, and you've got a ponding environment. Um, it's capped by a freshwater carbonate with there's wood and plants, um, and the sedimentology um, is in accordance with that. And we've got multiple um, bone, bone bearing levels that are within the top meter or so. Um, so yeah, this is um, this is what we think it might have been is one of these rivers draining the alluvial um, plain that's um, meeting the um, erg, the main part of the erg, and forming um, an interdual pond. Um, so here's you know one representative of what it might look like with you know happy spinachid on the ground. Um, so what sort of things do we find in these deposits? Well, we have this big. Um, semi-aquatic amphibian Eriops that has these head that kind of looks like the cover of a toilet bowl seat um, with big, this is where the eyes would be, uh, so you're looking down on the skull. But we do, the most abundant fossils are, is this terrestrial early mammal relative Spinacodon. Um, we have lots of different fossils from many multiple individuals, um, some of which were the, some of the bones, so this is part of the backbone, they're still in white position. We've got skulls and all sorts of stuff. Um, and we have other animals here. So we have some of these limbless amphibians um, and then other um, early relatives of, um, of mammals. This is one that we just prepared um, in the lab recently. It's a bit hard to see because it's so small, but there's uh, articulated limb and hand right here and other parts of the sternum and other parts of the animal. So nearly the entire animal is preserved as sort of this flattened assemblage of bone of an animal called a baronopid. Um, but the key take home message here is that um, these, this is a much more terrestrial assemblage is we don't have nearly as many fish or aquatic amphibians preserved, even though it's a pond environment. Um, so it really does, exemplify um, that this change from more aquatic to more terrestrial habitats, at least in the Paradox Basin. And although um, we haven't been working as much in the Oregon Rock Shale or Oregon Rock Formation that's at the top of the coupler, um, previous uh, data from there show it's a very, very terrestrial assemblage as well. Um, so 
what does it all mean though? You know, what, what is controlling this? Well, gotta stay tuned. We're still um, gathering all those paleoenvironmental data and refining um, the age constraints for correlation across the basin. Um, but we hope that with those data, we'll be able to tease apart, you know, things that might be related to sort of this long-term regression versus Pangaea moving northward and um, and potential glacial interglacial cyclicity um, that's represented in, in, in the uh, sedimentology. So um, we're we're hope with the core. Um, one of the first things we're going to do once we have all the major data sets is publish uh, scientific drilling. Um, manuscript, a manuscript in scientific drilling and open access journal to sort of make people just more aware that these scores exist and that they're available. Um, so with that, I'd like to transition um, to uh, about 90 million years later in time during the late Triassic period. This is the Chin Lee Formation that's widely exposed throughout the Colorado Plateau. And Bears Ears National Monument is a great place to uh, to look at uh, this formation and the fossil assemblages that it preserves. So I've been working in the Chin Li for most of my career. So um, because it's it represents almost 20 million years of time um, and preserves many different sort of sub environments and is a really rich archive of paleo environmental and biotic change for the late Triassic. Period. So by this time, um, the Earth is fully in a hothouse state. Um, in fact, during the late Triassic, um, depending on where you are, the carbon dioxide levels are anywhere from three to five times what they are today. Um, and, uh, and we're still pretty close to the equator, um, but there's no polarized caps whatsoever at this point. So that transition seemed to have occurred by the end of the firm. And of course, one of the reasons why people get excited about, about the late Triassic is it's when dinosaurs first evolved. But I think it's just a really cool interval because you have all these weird and wonderful creatures represented here in this Chinle ecosystem, yet only the things being eaten in the background here are actually dinosaurs. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, evolutionary experimentation going on, and some of those groups survive to dominate the rest of the Mesozoic, and in some cases alive today, whether they be birds, frogs, salamanders, lizards, mammals, those all have their origins in the Triassic period. So it's really a key interval for understanding the origin of our modern terrestrial ecosystems. And as I mentioned, um, it's a time of really high carbon dioxide. So here's where we are, uh, just above 400 ppm today. Um, and this gray bar is predicted levels um, for um, one scenario of the IPCC if we don't curtail our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and here is the Trias the late Triassic period. And you can see that there's proxy values that go from you know anywhere to be within that um, predicted level for the next century all the way up to almost 3,000 ppm. Um, so it's a really dynamic time climate-wise. Um, this is uh, what the Chin Li formation um, looks like in Bears Ears and related areas. So it's underlain by the moat early and middle uh, Triassic Moenkopi formation, and it's overlain by the Glen Canyon group, um, specifically the Wingate Sandstone, which is latest Triassic through earliest Jurassic, as well as then the Cayuga Navajo. Um, and this is pretty typical of the outcrops, is they're these steep slope forming outcrops. So it means a lot of hiking up and down and across these steep slopes, sliding down <laughs> occasionally, hopefully not too much. But despite that, those sort of challenging outcrops, we've been able to find a ton of fossils um, in southeastern Utah. Um, just showing our work um, in Indian Creek area, we've discovered over 400 new fossil localities in the last decade. Um, now, not every fossil locality is like the most amazing ever, but it's basically there are two or three Triassic localities known in Indian Creek before we started working there. So, it just shows you how much is un, sort of evaluated within Utah. There's many, many different geologic units and areas that you could say the same thing, but people just haven't looked. We don't know what's out there in terms of the paleontological heritage. Um, and I wanna also emphasize this, this is collaborative work with Andrew Milner at the St. George Dinosaur Discovery Site. We've been working together both in Indian Creek and Lisbon Valley um, since I started in 2009. Um, 
And so we work uh, very closely with him and his group um, out in the field and also on the research. And this work's been supported um, by the Canyonlands Natural History Association from several grants. So, um, and we really do have um, the entire ecosystem preserved. It's not just animals with backbones. So we get uh, different types of plants. Um, this is a, a very strange plant. Um, here's the central stalk, and then maybe you can see these palm like leaves radiating out. Here's a reconstruction. It's called San Miguel, and it seems to be a plant that's adapted for the drier conditions that are preserved in the upper part of the Chenli Formation. It's pretty widespread, um, but we have a number of different plant species. We get um, lots of invertebrate traces, including crayfish burrows, um, but also there are a couple of um, insect body fossils that we have. Um, and then um, we get um, lots and lots of fishes, which is unusual. So most parts of the Chinle Formation, you find maybe dispersed um, fish scales, but articulated fish like this are, are not common, but they seem to be really common in the upper part of the Chinle in southeastern Utah. So here you can see a little tiny fish. Here's just the edge of my my lens cap. So this fish is just about that long. Um, and here's the head, here's the dorsal fin and the tail. This is two fish that were, this is just how they were found in the field. So again, the head is buried in the sediment in both cases, but then you have the dorsal fin here and here, and then the tail. So these are gray fin fishes. Um, there's two major groups that are preserved, but there's at least half a dozen different species, if not more. We're still studying them. To They take a long time to prepare out of the rock because everything has to be done under a microscope. Um, here's just some other uh, fishes. You can see that some of them have very deep bodies and others are more streamlined. Um, there's a variety of tooth shape indicating some are herbivores, some are um, eating, you know, other arthropods in the water and whatnot. Um, and um, it's really cool. Some of the, this may, may look like a bit of an ugly fish, but here's the head and then the dorsal fin, the body, the tail. But if you zoom in, you can see like these, um, there's all this ornamentation on the scales. There are all these ridges here and grooves. They're really strange looking animals. Um, and there's a lot to, to figure out. Um, also in terms of the aquatic assemblage, we get these large flat headed amphibians that are called um, metoposaurs. Um, they're pretty rare in this assemblage because, oops, oops, I left for it. Um, pretty rare because this seems to be a fairly dry environment. And these, these particular amphibians seem to be really tied to water, but we do find their remains from time to time. The thing we find most of in terms of um, vertebrate fossils besides the fish is these animals that are called phytosaurs, that they look like modern crocodiles or alligators, but they're both not related other than being reptiles. They've totally independently evolved the long snout semi-aquatic um, ecological role. And one of the reasons we can tell they independently evolved that is that their nostrils are between their eyes. Whereas if you think about an alligator or a crocodile, their nostrils are the tip of their snout. So different bones of the jaw elongated uh, evolutionarily through time. So this is one skull and lower jaw that's being worked on in the lab from Indian Creek. And usually we spend lots and lots of time rock sawing these things out because um, they're big skulls and, um, and there's often lots of overburden above them. So um, up, sometimes up to a week, just getting a single skull out. Um, all under permit, of course, from the BLM and, and state uh, as well. So, um, but here's a, one of the most beautiful skulls. So this is a top-down view on the left, and you're looking at the palate, so the roof of the mouth. You can see all the tooth sockets with a couple of teeth preserved. They have these big sort of hooks at the end for snagging whatever they want to eat. Um, and on this side, here's where the eyes would be, and there's the nostrils. So. Um, there's several different species. We're still working on that, but um, they're really um, useful because the species that you find tell you a bit about where you are in the stratigraphic column as well. So um, it helps with correlation. Um, we also have remains of aetosaurs, which is another armored reptile group. They're plant eaters. So they kind of look like you put a pig snout on a reptile, like a 
armadillo's body, but it's a reptile, not a mammal. And they have these big strap-like pieces of ornamented armor. Um, that's what you're seeing in cross-section on the left and in top-down view on the right. Um, and the nice thing is the ornamentation is very diagnostic of the species. Um, we also have some of the large terrestrial predators, these animals called browsukids, which are distant relatives of modern crocodiles and alligators. So here's Part of an upper jaw on the left, you can see impressions of teeth, and then the lower one of the lower jaws here with teeth as well. And most of the bone had already fallen out, but we CT scan it so we can digitally make a uh, a natural cast of those bones. And we actually also saw that in the block there's more of the skull embedded within the rock, so we're uh, we'll digitally prepare that up. Um, but it's not just bones and teeth. There's uh, evidence of behavior through footprints and things like that. Um, we have footprints of these different groups that we've talked about, like phytosaurs and aetosaurs. And in the case of phytosaurs, we even get swim tracks where just the tips of their toes are grazing the bottom of the river. Um, and um, so we can see they're both walking on land as well as swimming. Um, but we also get uh, footprints of animals that we don't have many bones of. So, this uh, tiny little footprint here, you can see my, my index finger for scale. There's little fingers and claw impressions here. So that footprint's only that big. And that's probably from a small um, aquatic long-necked reptile called a Stanistrophia, of which we've only found a few vertebrae. So finding these footprints, which are much more numerous, help us document um, where they're living and how, you know, what, what's their extent through time. And our only record of early dinosaurs in Utah is actually from the footprints. We haven't found a single verifiable bone of a Triassic dinosaur from Utah. But based on the footprints, we know that they're there. They're not very common, and they're all small, meat-eating dinosaurs. Um, but they are leaving their impressions. So here's a um, three tracks in a sequence. Here's another track. You can see this was sort of stickier, sloppier mud that it stepped in. Um, but we have yet to find the bones, and this is not uncommon in the fossil record where the trace fossil record is, doesn't match up in abundance with the body fossils that you find. Um, but so having that combination of both the footprints and the bones and teeth is really the only way to reconstruct what these ecosystems were like. And I've mentioned several times that although these are fluvial environments, so they're river river and floodplain environments. It's a fairly dry environment. And based on data from Utah and New Mexico, um, these this was a very seasonal uh, environment in the late Triassic. So there was a wet season and there's a dry season. There would have been pretty, um, pretty common wildfires. Um, there were forests, but they were probably pretty localized um, with you know lower vegetation across much of the floodplain. Um, and so, it would have been a bit wetter than Southern Utah today, but not by much. And so in some ways, um, Southern Utah today is not too different other than having colder winters than the late Triassic uh, time. And beyond just you know understanding what fossils are here, the, one of the reasons why this fossil record of the Chinle formation in Southeastern Utah is so important is that it's the, the best record we have um, anywhere in North America of what ecosystems were like just before the untriassic mass extinction. So at the end of the Triassic, you have these giant flood basalt eruptions called the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province that caused runaway global warming and caused one of the five, five largest mass extinction events. Um, but particularly on land, terrestrial ecosystems, we don't have very many places that record sort of what was going on in the few million years before that. Um, you know, were these ecosystems already being stressed? You know, were they already suffering extinctions or having a lot of species turnover? Um, and so we can only answer that by looking at the fossil record. And southeastern Utah is one of the best places to sort of provide that context for what's happening on land just before this extinction event. So uh, with that, I'll say thank you and uh, happy to take questions. <laughs>